Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm your guinea pigs tonight. I'm actually going to talk about something I haven't talked about yet, something I've been thinking about a lot and has been uh, sort of bouncing around in my mind, but I, you're the first audience I've kind of uh, dumped this theory on, so bear with me. <laughs> tonight I'm going to talk about makers and places and the relationships between the two. And the thinking about this has actually come from looking at photos of my hometown. Um, this is Newcastle. Uh, I've been very lucky that online the University of Newcastle has these fantastic uh, cultural collection archives and I've been browsing them and looking at them and, and getting lost in them. I, I'm basically a nerd and that sort of how I like to spend my recreational hours. These photos are from you know, sort of late 1800s, early 20th century. Um, and what I find interesting about them at first was things like the fact that there's uh, you know, horse and buggies and old forms of transport you know, the way that people dressed. Um, but what I start, uh, well, this example, this is, an old, this is an old building that if you look really carefully later, you'll see this and how, what it's become. But what's happened to places that are very familiar to me and how different they were back then. Um, what I became very interested in, the more I looked at it, was the thing that wasn't so obvious. It was something that you actually had to kind of look a while to see. And you can sort of see it a little bit here. There's a um, hat and cap manufacturer there. Uh, this one has a milliner, a ladies' emporium, and uh, another clothes maker, Taylor and Mercer, uh, a confectioner, um, a manufacturer of confectionery. They, uh, they both imported and manufactured confectionery on site. This, uh, on the corner here, you can see another milliner, and then next to it is a jeweler. And my mental picture of what a jeweler is, is uh, a, you know, a, a sort of shop you go into to buy jewellery. Someone else has made and do a little bit of um, uh, mending and they can kind of tweak it on site. But that's not what a jeweler was back then. That was what was going on out the back. What's really interesting, which I'd kind of never really thought about before, is that this main street that I'd known all my life as a place where people sold stuff began life as a place where people made stuff. The selling is actually kind of just the latest incarnation of a much longer process. Um, this, I, I love this one, it's a bit further west, but this is a cycle builder. And if you look really carefully, it says bicycles built to order. If you want a custom made bike, you just walk along and get it, they do also have motor car requisites if you need something specific for your motor car. But um, this was a very different world. And, you know, this is kind of how the world used to work back then. You know, like if you, if you, were, a, if you were a maker of clothes or confectionery or jewellery or bicycles, you would make it somewhere in a major city or a minor city and then your market would be the people who were close enough to travel to you. Um, and you can sort of see, you know, all over the country that was kind of how it worked. And then you know, probably before I was born, this began to change. You know, the, virtually any industry you think of, it became more and more consolidated. So, you know, bicycles, we, um, you know, we stopped having bicycle manufacturers in every suburb and every street. And instead, you know, we had one or two national bicycle manufacturers and they moved to a factory in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or somewhere and they sold bicycles everywhere else around the country. Um, this worked really well for a while, you know. So by the 1940s to the 1960s, um, this is the same main street I was showing you before. This is, you know, it's vibrant, it's alive, but it's a retail strip now. It's not full of makers, it's full of people buying stuff. Um, this, this is almost starting to be familiar from when I was a kid. Um, this is probably the 50s and 60s. Uh, you can see the national brands, Sol Pattinson, Coles, whatever, you know. By this point, the distribution chains had kind of come into effect. And um, this centre of the city that was, uh, I showed you earlier had turned, transformed into a place where big companies sold stuff that was made somewhere else. This is Hunter Street, Newcastle, probably in the, uh, in the 60s, I guess. And it's vibrant, it's buzzing, it's alive. Uh, there's lots of people that are coming into town to shop, and it works. But the problem with this model of retail and people selling things is that um, the world changed. The world continues to change. So when, where we used to have these national manufacturers that would sell things from Sydney and all around the country, the world became more like this. 
big companies all over the world. Uh, things became more consolidated. And then even more consolidated to the point where most of the stuff we buy nowadays is made in factories in China or Europe or the Americas or occasionally Australia. And the distribution chains stretch out across the world. And I guess as, around the time I was coming of age, this is what the world looked like. And this is what I thought the world naturally looked like. People made stuff out there somewhere I couldn't see it. And we went looking for places to buy stuff near where we lived. And these are the kind of places that made more sense to buy stuff. Not the big main streets that we talked about before, or showed you before, but uh, this is my local shopping centre. I spent, uh, it actually had changed a bit by the time I got there, but um, when I was a teenager, I spent an awful lot of time hanging out and making trouble in the general vicinity of this shopping centre. This is another one, uh, near another, another place where I grew up, and um, you know, again, massive, you know, it's a Woolworths, it's a big W, the big chains are there. And this is kind of what, what retail had become, what consumption had become. Creation had disappeared. This was, you know, it was all about consumption. This same shopping centre now looks like that. The entire um, car park and open space, whatever I showed you, it's gone. The whole thing has become this massive, it's a Westfield now, it's an enclosed entity. Um, you know, there's, I don't know, hundreds, I've got no idea how many shops are there. Uh, but, the, you know, the world has changed. Unfortunately, the world has changed for that main street I showed you before, the one that I was really fascinated to buy and showing you all the photos of. Newcastle, uh, that had this rather peculiar thing of this long, thin main street with lots and lots of shops lined along it. All up in about uh, 2008 when I compiled these notes, there was about 150 empty buildings in the two main streets. Shops I'd showed you before, every one of those red dots is an empty building. These are some of the same buildings you were looking at before. That, you know what I said before, I'll show you one again later? That's the one. That's what it become. I feel like I should talk to this, but I don't feel like I need to. Um, I took all these photos in about 2008. Um, and I was, around this time, I was very fascinated by, you know, what was going wrong in Newcastle and what maybe you could do to fix it. It's just kind of a long walk along the long main street. But that's not where the story ends because um, for a long time what people had talked about that needed to happen in this place was a rediscovery of its days as a grand retail place. That idea that all of those big shops that had moved out to the suburbs and the suburban shopping centres, the question was how do you bring them back in? How do you get the Coles and the Woolworths and the Sol Pattinsons to come back and open up along this long main street? But while everyone was having that debate and wondering about it, something very different started to happen. We actually started to see the return of the maker, the idea that people in local communities make stuff. Um, I kept trying to make that not animate and I couldn't work out how. Um, I started this project in 2008, which I'm about to talk about, but from 2001 to 2007, there was the biggest upsurge in cultural production you could possibly imagine in Australia. So um, you can sort of see, it's probably hard to see the graph, but take jewellery. In 2001, there were 25,000 jewellers in Australia manufacturing professionally or semi-professionally. By 2007, there were nearly 200,000. It was an eight-fold increase in six years. Uh, you can see that the number of professional or semi-professional visual artists tripled in six years. And crafts, um, drawing, uh, the whole uh, computer art, which kind of creeps up from the bottom there, there's a whole range of people suddenly started making stuff again. It's very unusual because, you know, this, this phenomenon had disappeared from our cities for such a long time. What is, what's starting to happen was not just that big-scale retail centralised stuff in China, but people in local communities making stuff for themselves and for each other and to share. So gradually, the map of the country and the map of the world has started to fill out with lots of people making things themselves for their own local communities, their communities of peers and their audiences. And what has changed dramatically was when I showed you before the idea that if you made something in Newcastle, you could only sell it to people in Newcastle. People from Melbourne are selling in Mumbai. People from Shanghai are buying stuff from Sydney. People from Newcastle are selling stuff to New York. Uh, 
what's changed is where the audience is. Suddenly everyone has the capacity to access the economies of scale and the distribution that were once only available to large multinational firms. Um, Etsy, craft website. Uh, I took this a few years ago. There were 700 and something items being sold for sale in Newcastle. Looked up this morning, there was over 2,000. It's growing like this. Amazingly, 70% of Etsy sales in Australia are international exports. Every local community in Australia now has makers selling their stuff all around the world. And the project that I've been involved in in Newcastle, which began with those empty buildings, is about reconnecting those makers to their place. We have been uh, very fortunate in that uh, lots of property owners were unfortunate, and there's a lot of empty space in the centre of the city. This was the main mall. This was, um, this was it in the first maker era. This was it in the shopping centre era, the first shopping era, mass shopping era. And then this is kind of as I start to remember it. This, my grandmother used to dress up to go shopping in this street in the early 80s. Um, this is what it was like in 2008. Empty, 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 empty. I feel obliged to point out that was a peak lunchtime crowd. That's them. Um, what we did was take those spaces and give them back to makers, give them back to people who were creating stuff, not simply trying to sell stuff. We found local artisans, photographers, another photographer, fashion designers, uh, craftspeople, Upcycle designers, co-working spaces, craftspeople, the list goes on and on. We took these spaces that no one was using and we made them available to people who didn't just want to sell stuff, but who wanted to make stuff. It's funny because I thought this was a radical reinterpretation of what these spaces could be used for. And when I started doing this, I had no idea that these spaces had once been spaces where people made stuff, and that's what they would have originally been designed for. Milliners. Um, there's 100 milliners in those photos I looked at earlier. Jewelers. These guys are manufacturing their jewelry on site. They're not quite of the scale of that workshop I showed you earlier, but that's what's going on there. And tailors, albeit like 19, 20, 21 year olds making streetwear. But they're there and they're making stuff. Now, what's interesting about this is that the whole world of retail is starting to change yet again. Um, there's, there's websites now that basically look at like empty shopping centre porn online, where you just kind of look at photos of shopping centres collapsing and decaying, and I, I find it kind of appealing in some ways. Um, empty, empty. And the reason is that all that predictable distribution consumption stuff that those enclosed shopping centres do so well well, you don't need to go there for it anymore. Most of the stuff you can buy there, you can press a click and you can order it, and if you know what you're going to get, you don't need to go there to find it. Uh, Jerry Harvey, God bless his soul, is complaining that everyone's buying stuff online so he can't make a living anymore. Uh, the recession in America is turning malls into ghost towns. In the UK, um, in the last... Same period, basically, that Renew Newcastle has been operating, 208 national retail chains went broke, either in receivership or in um, uh, total bankruptcy. They had 21,000 shops between them. They employed 200,000 people, and they're gone. What was happening in Newcastle? Uh, we were taking spaces like this, and allowing a local record label recording the music of local musicians and selling it all around the world to move in there. Taking a space like this and making it available to local makers, mums, craftspeople, designers, artisans to do their stuff. Taking a space like this and making it available to a young surf photographer who was making um, amazing photos of local surfing and surfers and surf culture. This, which was an old sort of 1950s era doctor's surgery, became a hub for local um, uh, filmmakers, designers, craftspeople, and others. 
This whole street had been worrying for ages about what's going to happen. How do you get the retailers to come back? The retailers haven't come back. What's come back are the makers. Whether they're making coffee, whether they're making clothes, whether they're making uh, photographs, the makers have come back. The area, while retail chains were collapsing and shopping centres were emptying out all around the world, has gone from all of these empty buildings to gradually being filled up. All of these little dots are our, our projects in the green and new commercial businesses, many of whom make something themselves moving into that precinct. The whole area has transformed. And in 2011, Lonely Planet listed their top 10 cities of the world to visit list. Number one, New York. <laughs> Number nine was Newcastle. And their rationale was that Australia's most underrated city has transformed itself from a steel city to a creative hub through to all the projects that have been seeded there by Renew Newcastle. I want to finish with a simple question. I thought what I was doing was original. I thought I'd invented something that no one had ever thought of. I thought I was, had this great idea. What if you made all these spaces available to people who make stuff? No one's ever thought of that before. <laughs> Nothing old is new again. People had thought of that before. Um, I wonder now whether the challenge is not how places like Newcastle that were once designed for makers to adapt, uh, to, to occupy will adapt, but how places like the big empty shopping centres um, that are emptying out will respond to the changes that are now happening to them. Thank you very much. Yeah.